Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on proper volunteer utilization for improved patient experience. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening in on your computer's speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone option in the audio pane and dial, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have an opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing in your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Today our webinar will feature Carrie Brady, VHHA staff consultant, who will be reviewing the key roles of volunteers and volunteer strategies. We'll then pass it off to Margaret Colvin, Director of Patient Relations for Sentara Williamsburg Regional Medical Center, who will provide some insights into how her facility is deploying volunteers to help improve the patient's experience. All right, Carrie, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, everybody. So, I'm really excited about this webinar today because one of the things that we're really passionate about in this program is reversing the trend to have you do more with less, which is the pressure that a lot of organizations are under. And this webinar is really focused on an opportunity to help you um, get more, more resources that are available to you that perhaps you haven't tapped as fully as you could have um, so that you can uh, do less on your staff that are already overwhelmed with more resources by using your volunteer in creative and new ways, so it's very exciting. So we wanted to start off, we have a few polls and we're keeping them uh, comical. Mike puts in these, uh, these cartoons in here. Um, so the first poll is, uh, is your patient experience team working closely with your volunteers and the volunteer coordinator? So we wanted to get a sense of how frequently this is occurring. And if you could um, respond to that poll, then we'll, uh, we'll see where we are. Okay, so Mike's just put up the quick poll so that um, we'll get that response. In a lot of organizations, uh, you have a really dedicated volunteer corps, but the roles that they're being put in are sometimes the more traditional roles of, you know, going and offering patients magazines or other sorts of things, um, checking in on people, you know, the sort of traditional candy striper role. Or in some places, they're stuffing envelopes, they're doing other administrative tasks, um, you know, certainly working at the front desk, things like that. Those are all useful things to have volunteers do. But when you expand the roles of volunteers and have them involved in your patient experience efforts, you often expand your volunteer core because people get excited about having opportunities to really make a difference. So it's great to see that, that two-thirds of you, roughly, are already working closely with your volunteers and your volunteer coordinator. And for those of you that are already doing this, we hope that today's webinar will give you some fresh ideas for how you can expand what you're already doing. And for the nearly 40% of you that aren't doing that already, um, then we'll give you lots of places to start. So um, moving on to the next slide, there are three kind of key things that we want you to be thinking about in terms of how you're using your volunteers. So one is having the ability to have your volunteers provide perspective on the care that's being provided. You can think of them as your eyes and ears in the organization because they're everywhere, usually, in your organization. And if you enlist them to give you feedback on what's happening in the organization, they are a great resource for you. They can also directly engage with your patients and families and support them in their experience in the hospital, and they can support your staff. So we're going to talk about um, all three of those things. So when you train your volunteers to be observers. Um, the thing is, in a hospital every day, suggestions are being made by your patients and families and by your staff. Sometimes we capture those suggestions in formal ways through rounding programs or on your surveys or things like that. But many other great ideas are out there every day in your facility. They'll be missed, though, if people aren't tuning into them. So I want to share a story from a hospital. Um, this was actually a staff person who picked this up, not a volunteer, but it could have just as easily been a volunteer, and it resulted in the hospital changing their hand-washing program. So a mother was in the hospital with her son. Her son was the patient, and uh, she was commenting to a staff member that she was frustrated that when the meal tray came up, she at home would have made her son wash his hands before dinner. That was just part of her routine. But in the hospital, even though he was touching all kinds of things, he was bed bound, so she couldn't get him out of bed to go wash his hands, and she was frustrated that this was not happening. 
And she just happened to mention this. Well, the staff member was listening, went back to the infection control committee and said, hey, you know, this is an opportunity. And in addition to now providing the sanitizing towelettes with every meal at that hospital, they changed what they were doing and their tray liners on their trays actually have education about infection control and what patients and families can do to be part of infection control efforts. And they have a few different tray liners. So it comes up with educational information about hand hygiene hygiene, um, among other things, and as well as the ability to wash hands. And that all came about because a mom made this comment to a staff member. So if you convene your volunteers and say, hey, listen, while you're going around the hospital and doing what you're doing here, keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities and suggestions that people are making, even if they're not formal. If anyone is frustrated about something or you see an opportunity, bring it back and report it. Some organizations actually put together a hotline for volunteers so that they can share that information. Um, but think of them as a core of people who are really invested in your organization and want to give you feedback if you invite them to do so. Because if you don't invite them to do so, most of the time they're not gonna do it. They're gonna notice things, but they're not gonna give you the feedback. So we wanna go to our next poll question, which is asking about how many of you are regularly engaging your volunteers to give fresh perspectives to your clinical or administrative staff? And Mike, I don't, I'm sorry, Mike, this isn't advancing now on mine. I don't know why. Okay, I got it. Okay, thanks. So if you can pull the poll question up, that would be great. So what we're really asking is how many of you are doing this already um, with your clinical and administrative staff? Mike, is yours going forward? Is it just my computer? Uh, mine is going forward. Um, right after this poll, we'll we'll do another test real quick. Okay, because mine Are you able appears... to see the poll? No. Uh, okay, so we're just going to go. I'm going to let you do this because for whatever reason... Oh, now I can. Okay. Okay. Okay, so these answers are fairly consistent. So almost 70% of you are already getting these fresh perspectives from your volunteers. A third of you are not doing it. So see, Virginia, you guys are on the ball. You're doing these things. So that's great. So, um, Mike, I'm just going to let you drive. And <laughs> so if you can move okay. into the next question. Um, so we have uh, six strategies that we want to share with you um, of things that you could do um, with your volunteers. So um, you can see here what the six are, so it's just kind of a quick reference. Um, these are not an exhaustive list, but just six things for you to think about. So um, the first one is about partnering with volunteers as patients and family. Um, we also, I think we skipped a question, Mike, about having volunteers take the HCAP survey, so I want to mention that. If you haven't had your volunteers take the HCAP survey, that's a really great exercise to do with your volunteers because if you give them the survey and ask them to complete the questions based on either their own experience in your hospital, the experience of a loved one if they've had a loved one in the hospital, or just what they've observed as volunteers if they haven't had a direct clinical experience in your hospital, you'll gain some really important insights about what's going on in the organization. And then if you facilitate a discussion about those results, um, that can be really powerful for quality improvement because, again, these people are already invested in your organization and they're kind of insider outsiders I mean they they are community members who are volunteering so they're not your staff they'll tell you you know what it is like it is um, but they also are predisposed to have a positive attitude toward the hospital because they're volunteering there so obviously they think you're doing important work and they want to be a part of it so they can be a great resource for you um, in partnering with volunteers as patients and family in addition to doing that HCAP survey having them take that you can have them um, come in as a focus group with your volunteers. So any volunteers who have had experience in your organization can come in and be part of a focus group. And again, they'll be very candid with you and share their experiences, which can be very powerful. They're a great uh, place to recruit for your patient and family advisory council or to pull them onto other hospital committees. Sometimes that's formal and you might have them permanently operating on particular committees. Sometimes you can use them as informal advisors. Say you're working on 
uh, a project, you're revising your um, discharge summaries or um, your information for consent or whatever, any kind of paperwork that you're revising in the hospital, it's always good to run that by some patients and family members. If you don't have an established counsel in place, pull from your volunteers and run it by some of them because they'll give you some feedback. They're also great to go around your hospital and do wayfinding. So you may think your signage is good and it might be fantastic, but if you take your volunteers and have them give them directions to go from the front lobby to particular destinations and have them note where they got lost or what was clear, what was difficult, that's very helpful. And volunteers usually really like to do that because it's something where they feel like they're really making a difference, but they can give you that fresh perspective. And as I mentioned, you can create a hotline for these volunteer ideas so that they know that you really want them. Can you go to the next slide, please, Mike? Another thing that you can do with your volunteers is have them involved in both rounding and shadowing. So um, their rounding and shadowing are slightly different, um, but because volunteers are constantly interacting with patients, and patients will often say things to volunteers that they will not say to the clinical staff. So um, they get these perspectives, and you can help um, the organization prioritize what you're doing um, and identify Slack resources based on the feedback that your volunteers get. So in volunteer rounding, which Margaret is going to talk some more about, um, there's lots of different purposes you can do it. You can have them round on a specific topic. You can have them rounding to identify any broad patient needs. Um, you can have volunteers rounding as a friendly visitor. And this is something that's really important for a lot of people because when you have patients in the hospital that may not have loved ones with them, um, they can, and they're scared or um, in pain or just having a very challenging time, it can be very helpful to have a volunteer come and just sit with them and talk to them. And um, that takes some of the pressure off staff. And the patient has a better experience because they have someone there sitting with them. It reduces their anxiety. It's distracting. Some of the volunteers really enjoy it. Just sitting and spending some time. Um, so that can be a really positive thing. Volunteers also can be used to conduct exit interviews on the day of discharge, which also can give you really powerful information because sometimes your patients aren't going to tell the nurse or the physician who's discharging them about some problem. Like maybe they can't get to the pharmacy because they don't have anyone to drive them there, or maybe they're worried about um, getting out of the hospital at a particular time because they have a child care issue or a transportation issue or something like that. They won't always share that with your clinical staff, but typically they will tell volunteers. So if your volunteers are connected and part of the team, then they can get that information to the right people. Um, volunteer shadowing is a little bit different in that volunteer shadowing involves volunteers following a patient through their entire experience um, in the hospital. Now, obviously, they're not spending the night with the patient, but they might follow a patient when they come in through the ED, and they're just noting what that experience is like throughout, um, throughout the entire time. And they're making notes about what's working well and what's not working well. So if they're shadowing someone who's coming through the ED, obviously, you need permission of the person that's being shadowed. Otherwise, that would just be creepy. Um, and you need consent. So um, you would explain to the, the person that you're proposing being shadowed what you're doing, that this is a quality improvement initiative, that this is a volunteer who would be there um, to follow them through the steps of the process and identify any opportunities for improvement. The patient usually gives feedback throughout, which the volunteer is also jotting down. But the volunteer may note other things that the patient isn't noting, like, you know, is the person being greeted warm? Were they being kept informed of delays? They're just kind of jotting down their impressions. So it can be a very simple tool that you're having them know about, or you can be asking them to look for particular things if there are particular quality improvement initiatives going on and you want to make sure that it's being done. So let's say bedside shift reporting, for example, if you want the volunteers to validate that that's being done, then that can be a specific question that you have on their shadowing tool. Did you see bedside shift reporting take place? You know, when did it take place? who was present, so on. You can ask them specific questions. And um, they're in that role of neutral observer, and they give the feedback. So this is useful not only for uh, giving you quality improvement initiatives that you can work on, it also helps to identify specific issues for that particular patient. So if the volunteer hears something that is of concern, they can then report that to the staff and get that issue addressed right away. And in organizations that have done this and had people go through the shadowing process, 
it's amazing how many things get identified, usually in the nature of miscommunications or misunderstandings, that the staff comes in, has a conversation with the patient and family, staff leaves, and what the patient and family understood is not necessarily what the volunteer heard or what staff intended. So those things can be addressed, so it's very helpful. So um, our next poll is about are you using uh, volunteers in this way in engaging um, patients and families in their care in any sort of way? So while we're waiting for that poll to come in, um, there are lots of ways to directly engage your patients and families in addition to rounding and shadowing. Um, there are ways to personalize patient care um, as an ambassador or a care partner. And again, you, you get a different core of volunteers and you can expand your core of volunteers when you expand the opportunities. So one thing that I know Margaret will mention is um, they have volunteers who are maybe getting ready to go to medical school or who are interested in pursuing a medical profession in some way. And so when you have those people acting as volunteers and they're involved in direct patient interactions, they love to come and do that. It's a win-win for everyone. They're very engaged volunteers. They're supporting your patients. And they're also helping build their own resume and experience and evaluating whether a healthcare career is something they really want to pursue. So they're very motivated and engaged and can be uh, incredibly valuable volunteers. Um, they can also help with orienting patients to the hospital um, and connecting patients with other resources. So if the patient notices something that isn't clean, then the volunteer can connect them to environmental services or whomever the, the right place is. All right, you guys are being fairly consistent here with your, with your percentages, which I suppose makes sense because those of you who have programs in place are, are tapping into all the different ways that you can utilize volunteers, which is fabulous. Um, one of the other things that volunteers can do, which is really powerful, is to educate patients about hospital processes. There's often misunderstandings about hospital processes. And sometimes when hospitals put processes in place, like bedside shift reporting, then they get frustrated because staff will give feedback that patients don't want to participate. So patients are not getting involved uh, in the bedside shift reporting. Well, that may be because the patients don't know that bedside shift reporting is really an opportunity to get involved. Um, there was a panel that I was on at one point with a gentleman who was a heart transplant patient, and it was really powerful because he was in the hospital for a couple of months. And he said that it wasn't until he had been in the hospital maybe three weeks or so that was the first time that someone told him that bedside shift reporting was really his opportunity to ask questions and to listen and validate information and that he was welcome to participate. Before that, for the entire three weeks, every time they were doing bedside shift reporting, he thought that this was just a staff thing and he completely tuned out, was not engaged in it at all because nobody told him that that was being done at the bedside for his benefit. So. One thing that some organizations do with their volunteers is before a shift reporting is going to take place, the volunteers pre-round on patients before shift reporting remind them that shift reporting is about to happen. If they're new to the hospital, they explain why bedside shift reporting happens and what the point is of involving the patient. And then they record any questions the patient has in advance. So maybe the volunteer's rounding an hour ahead of time, having the opportunity for the patient to write down the questions. And then when bedside shift reporting is taking place or when other interdisciplinary rounding is taking place, the questions are already there because the volunteer has already gathered them. So now you're not putting the patient on the spot that they have to remember everything right in the moment when all the staff is in their room. They're getting it ahead of time and those questions are being captured. So it helps the patients. They have a better experience. It also helps the staff because now you know what those questions are when you're coming in the room. So that's a creative way that you can use your volunteers. Um, and you can do that with other hospital processes as well. A simple thing that comes up all the time in focus groups is that patients don't realize they have access to food after hours. And most patients, because of when they get their dinner in the hospital, they're hungry later at night, or maybe they've had procedures and they 
want to get, you know, something later because they haven't been able to eat. They've been NPO for a while. So volunteers can also be rounding and reminding people what food options there are available at the non-traditional times, offering to get people a snack, educating them about those processes, because even in hospitals that have very well-established after-hours food options, and they think that they're doing that education on admission, and it is in the admissions materials that can hand it out, I, I cannot begin to tell you, it's probably 80% of the time when I'm doing focus groups, there are patients in there that will say they had no idea that they could get food and that they are starving. So that will help, just a simple thing that you can do with your volunteers rounding. Um, so that's good. And volunteers also can get to know the person um, not just as a patient, but as a person, and to share information that's useful for staff. So they can find out um, what this person really likes. Maybe they're really into sports, for example. And if that gets captured by the hospital, the volunteer gets that information that gets captured. Now, when staff members are coming in, they can ask about the game or ask about something. It's a way of making a connection with that patient very quickly um, that then helps pave the way for the clinical care because you're having some sort of connection. Um, next slide, please, Mike. Volunteers can also assist in care transitions. Informed waiting is really a key thing. Um, I was with my daughter in the emergency department recently, and thank goodness they were doing a good job of keeping us informed. But when you don't know how long something is going to take, or when you've been told, like, oh, test results will take about an hour, when it gets to that hour, you're wondering, like, are they coming back with my results? Uh, has something happened? Do, you know, was there a problem with the test? Did they forget about me? I mean, you have really nothing to do but wonder when you're sitting there and worried. So volunteers can help with informed waiting, just keeping people posted. Helps in surgery um, and, uh, you know, procedures, other types of things where you're waiting for something or waiting for test results, just checking in and keeping people informed. They can also provide therapeutic diversions. I mean, you can sit there and do a crossword puzzle with somebody. You can do simple art projects with people. Um, Yes, these are not clinical, but they take people's minds off of their anxiety about whatever they're experiencing. So it can be very therapeutic to have your volunteers in there. And volunteers can also be involved in post-discharge phone calls. Um, so often that's done by clinical staff, but for certain types of things, as long as you have a process where that volunteer is trained and can make a referral to a clinical staff member um, immediately if needed, volunteers can help out with those post-discharge phone calls because they can get a lot of really helpful information for quality improvement for the hospital. And next slide, please, Mike. In terms of age caps, here's a specific and creative thing um, that organizations are doing to address some of the age caps specific questions involving volunteers. So this hospital developed a menu of pain control and comfort options because what they found was that other than the pharmacologic option, we give you more pain medicine or, you know, we have the... Um, the IV pain pump that you can use, um, the, the staff was not consistently offering other types of things uh, that the patient could do, like warm and cold compresses, different kind of positioning, um, other things like that. So what you can do with your volunteers, among other things, is have your volunteers asking patients how, what they do to manage their pain at home. If they've come in with some kind of chronic condition, they've been managing their pain at home. So if the volunteers are gathering information about how that pain is being managed at home, giving that information to the clinical staff and then working together to identify what are some of these non-pharmacologic options that we can do, volunteers can help to get patients warmer cold compresses, they can bring them warm blankets, a cup of tea, um, things that will help alleviate their pain potentially, certainly their anxiety. And again, you're expanding the staff that's available to address the need. So now it's not just the nurse or the physician that can address pain with appropriate training and appropriate supervision. You've got your volunteers helping to address pain in these non-clinical ways of addressing it. So that can be really valuable as well. So finally, before we turn it over to Margaret, we're going to talk a little bit about how do you use volunteers to support your clinical staff. And by that, I mean not just to give a fresh perspective, but to actually care for your caregivers. Are you involving your volunteers in caring for the caregiver? And this is an overlooked opportunity in many organizations because Volunteers not only can step in and provide support for caregivers when maybe a unit is having a particularly challenging day, um, maybe it's labor and delivery and they are slammed with patients, so volunteers could come up and bring a snack cart up there to help support your staff, 
but they also can help reinforce for caregivers on an ongoing basis the importance of what they do by just complimenting caregivers as they go around. If you empower your volunteers to say, hey, when you see a staff member do something fantastic, just say, wow, that was really great, or whatever it is that you want them to say, but just empower them to actually give some feedback to your clinical staff. That can make a difference. Um, again, we're, we're fairly consistent numbers here. Um, so congratulations, you guys are doing a super good job already. Um, so you can help to restore a sense of purpose because in the crush of the average day in a hospital, there are so many things on your staff members to do list and it's easy sometimes for them to lose perspective on why they're doing what they're doing and they may feel unappreciated and sometimes your HCAP survey results or other feedback because you're addressing complaints and all that may make them feel like what they do isn't making a difference or that they're failing um, and then people just get frustrated and that's very difficult. So to improve your patient experience, you want to make sure that your caregivers are very well taken care of and that they understand that they're appreciated and that you as, uh, as the administration in the organization as well as the patients really do appreciate what they're doing and how they bring themselves to work every day. So one way to do that is through a quote of the day. Some organizations do this and your volunteers can be involved in helping uh, distribute that quote of the day or identify that quote of the day, just something inspiring. Um, organizations that do huddles sometimes do a little devotion at the beginning of the huddle. It doesn't have to be a religious devotion in any way, but just some kind of statement that re-inspires people. And sometimes it's a story and it could be volunteers who are sharing those stories. Just a very brief story about an interaction that made a difference for a patient. Um, and that can just remind people what they're doing. Um, sharing compliments with staff really helps to build relationships and boost morale among staff too. So, if the volunteer observes something, like I said, they can tell staff, but also if the volunteer is in a patient room and the patient says something about a staff member who has done a fabulous job or they really appreciate you know, their night nurse because uh, she came in and brought them a cup of tea or um, whatever it may be, um, have the volunteers share that information back with staff. Um, I already mentioned the comfort cart, so that can be very valuable. The lending a hand can be very important for caring for the caregiver. Some organizations have formal processes where any staff member can call down to the volunteer office and request a volunteer to lend a hand. And these volunteers are volunteers who are either already in the building or sometimes it's volunteers who live nearby who have offered to lend a hand for different kinds of scenarios. So for example, you sometimes have patients who come in um, and they've got young children with them and now the young children are there they're not being closely supervised because the parent who brought them in is dealing with whatever health issue they're dealing with. So the staff member can call down and ask a volunteer who wants to come up and play with the kids. And there are a roster of volunteers that are willing to be called in to play with kids. Um, there are volunteers who are willing to come and be a companion to a patient, and that can be short or long-term. It can be, I'm going to come in and be a companion to this patient for the next few hours, or it can be, I'm taking on this patient in the role of kind of a care partner, which is a longer term role, and you're going you're gonna to be involved with that patient over the period of multiple days and just supporting them through their care and helping them to understand what's happening and then transitioning them back home. So if you talk to your staff members and you identify what are some times when they feel like they need non-clinical help? What needs to be done non-clinically for these patients that would create a better experience and would take some pressure off of your staff as well? And then how do you develop a volunteer core that can provide, you know, which of those needs can you meet with your volunteer core? And then how do you develop a core that um, can be called to do these various things? Because it gives the staff an opportunity when they're overwhelmed, when they feel like they need support, there's somebody for them to call. Because again, in a lot of focus groups, one of the hardest things for staff is, as one uh, nurse said it uh, to me at one point, they feel like they're in the foxhole alone. That when things get crazy and they're overwhelmed and they feel like everyone needs something, all of their patients and everything's happening at once, there's nobody that they can call to take the pressure off. So making that connection and supporting your staff in that way with the volunteers can be very powerful in terms of um, 
improving attitudes of your staff members because they no longer feel like they're alone when it's chaotic. They feel that they're being supported and the volunteers can help you do it um, and, and enjoy doing the kind of work. And consider if you have enough of a volunteer core, embedding volunteers in specific units. So I'm going to share an example from when I was volunteering in a hospital. I was working in um, the radiation treatment center, so in a cancer center of a hospital. And I was working there and doing art projects with people. So I was a volunteer artist in residence doing our projects with the patients and with their family members. After I had been there a couple of months, what started to happen was when a patient would come in and their loved one with the best of intentions wouldn't let that patient get a word in edgewise with the nurse. And the nurse was trying to figure out what's really going on, how are they responding to the radiation, because of course that's a, that's a long-term course of treatment, so they were seeing these patients repeatedly. The nurse would bring the family member over to me and say, Carrie has this really special project that you can do to create some artwork for your loved one. So she's going to talk to you about that special project, and I did in fact have a special project, and I would talk to them about it, and the nurse would get 10 minutes alone with the patient. And the nurses were telling me that that was invaluable because sometimes the patient didn't want to speak up, say, in front of their spouse and say how terrible they were really feeling because they didn't want to worry their spouse. or there were maybe some other things that they wanted to mention, detailed the specific issues that they were having physically that again, they might not want to get into if it was their daughter who was you know, bringing them to the hospital or a neighbor. And so being able to separate out um, that loved one from the patient was really valuable for the nursing staff. And that's because I had developed a trusted relationship with them and they approached me and said, can we do this with you? Can we, when we use kind of this phrase, that means we need you to hold on to that person for 10 minutes and distract them so we can do what we need to do. And so in that way we were partnering and, uh, and it was something I would never have thought of. Um, but the nurses thought of it and because we had built that relationship, it made a difference. So think about if you can embed volunteers with specific teams or units, then and those opportunities just naturally grow out of that. So now I am going to turn you over to Margaret Cullivan. And Margaret and I have known each other for years. I met Margaret when I was working at Plain Tree years ago and was incredibly impressed with everything that she was doing, um, including the way that she's using volunteers. And I've continued to be um, incredibly impressed with the depth and rigor um, and quality of all of the programs that Margaret's offering. So you're really going to enjoy hearing from you or hearing from Margaret. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks. Carrie, thank you. Um, I also want to recognize um, how fortunate we are in the state of Virginia to have Carrie working so closely with VHHA um, to help all of us as we focus on improving the patient's experience. So I want to tell you about our hospital, um, Centero Williamsburg. Um, it is an acute care setting with 145 licensed beds. Um, located in a town that's known for the College of William and Mary, um, known to be a town that um, attracts a lot of retired military folks, a lot of um, retired folks in general. Um, a, you know, a great opportunity for um, this huge group that choose to call this home to immediately get invested in our community. Um, I often poll the audience during hospital orientation to find out who actually came from Williamsburg, and it's very rare if I find more than one person in the audience. So we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, we have, um, I'm a system, I'm a hospital in a system of 12 hospitals. Um, we have over 500 volunteers at our hospital, and they are considered an integral part of our healthcare team. And that number includes a, a very large group of high school students. Uh, we had 147 um, that went through our program this past summer, and then a very healthy um, relationship with the College of William & Mary with their pre-med program, as well as with Thomas Nelson Community College. They have a nursing associate degree program and their nurses do their clinicals at our hospital and often expand their experience by joining the volunteer team. Um, next slide. Um, and I wanted to um, come in from the angle of what we did um, really when we were doing a deep dive on our data and looking at how have we improved our patient satisfaction scores? 
And so we zeroed in on three years um, from 2013 to 2016 as we were entering a contest um, that NRC Health had to identify the top three hospitals in the country that were showing um, improved best practice. And we were really um, thrilled when we were doing our deep dive and we realized that from 2013 to 2016, we, um, Centera Williamsburg, consistently went up um, in small increments, but you know, we kept um, the focus on doing the right thing at the right time, all the time for the patient and their family. And that little um, drive, consistently went uphill for those three years and brought us from an 80.1 up to an 84.8. And when we did the real deep dive on that three-year period, we realized that, you know, it wasn't just the staff. It was clearly the volunteers who played a radical part in having us um, achieve that award. We were honored um, with one of the top three awards in the country. And so what we did with that, we looked at five different, um, we focused on five of the key domains uh, with the NRC survey. And we looked at communication with physicians, communication with nurses, information and education, respect for patient preferences, and responsiveness of hospital staff. And we looked at um, how we rated for those three years in those questions. And all of those questions, um, we improved in them, and yet we still had you know, a ways to go to be in the top 10% in the country. As you can see from the, the blue would be the top 10%. And what we realized is that a huge part of our success was because of rounding, purposeful rounding, not just from the clinical staff, but from the volunteers who helped us as well. Um, Carrie talked earlier about how important it is to engage um, patients and families, um, and this definitely helped us. When we went into this, we began by looking at, you know, how did these volunteers impact the improvement of our scores? So. We looked at our PALS program, and that's Patient Assistant Liaison, and those are the um, folks who round with a purpose. I'm going to do a, a much deeper dive on them um, you know, in a few minutes. But then our frontline staff, you know, the, the folks that pick these um, patients and their families up in the golf carts. These golf carts, um, we have five of them. They were purchased with lost golf balls in our community. The balls are cleaned up sold in the gift shop, and those dollars have helped purchase the golf carts at an average of about $6,000 a cart. The golf cart drivers are all volunteers. Um, most of them are men. We did have um, the golf coach at William & Mary, the female golf coach, was one of our drivers. But they are the first eyes and ears of the patient and their family members when they're coming into the um, the hospital. So they can help us as gatekeepers um, really begin to, you know, to help us to understand any unusual circumstance. We're a tourist town, you know, if this golf cart driver discovers that these folks were here on a tour and, you know, one of their tour members is now in the ICU, uh, they will immediately report that to the volunteer manager who then will report that up to the ICU manager. So, um, and then internally, the volunteer uh, transport team, those are the folks that help um, discharge the patients in the wheelchairs. They transport blood throughout the hospital. Um, when asked to, they deliver mail, they deliver flowers. Um, and then you've got the frontline receptionists. Um, we have three main lobbies. We have another um, facility connected to us, a physician's building, and there is a lobby there. And those volunteers also um, are the front line. They're the first person other than the golf cart driver if they're driven in. If they walk in, they're the first person uh, that the patient or family member sees, and they're also the last. So they can give first impressions and lasting impressions. And then the Patient and Family Advisory Council. We found this group um, who are really the pulse of the community. Uh, the requirement is they have to have been a patient or a former 
um, assistant of a patient, so the support of a patient, their their spouse, their friend, their family member, um, they're advocates of the hospital. They've helped us with mystery shopping. Uh, when Carrie spoke earlier about the infection control with the mom who raised her concern about um, folks washing their hands, our um, uh, patient and family advisory council members strategically place themselves around the hospital and help to make sure that our staff, including the physicians, are you know gelling in and gelling out when they go in and out of a patient's room. Um, they report any um, you know issues with cleanliness immediately to the manager of the environmental service department, so we can um, you know really nip any issues around cleanliness right in the bud. And then they help us review educational materials. Anything that goes out to the public that's printed, all 12 hospitals have patient and family advisory councils. And this material goes um, through the patient and family teams. Uh, they're you know, one of the um, areas that that team is one of the teams that we consider crucial in helping us to, you know, through the lens of a community member, um, many times somebody non-clinical, how is this educational material coming across to you? So um, the other thing is that we've learned that with these volunteers, they're getting so much more information from not just the patient, but the extended patient, anyone who comes in to support them, family member, friends. And why is this? Because, you know, the patients feel that the staff are too busy. Uh, the staff don't want to be, uh, the patients feel they, you know, don't want to bother the staff. They feel um, they're fearful of being labeled a complainer. They are fearful of retribution. So if we can have our volunteers be that, you know, area of safeness um, where the patient and their family members can confide in them, a concern that they have, then, you know, that's a win for us as well. Um, then the, um, the PAL volunteer really is um, the group that, that do the purposeful rounding for us. And this program was launched in 2008. I have to tell you, I did get this idea from Plaintree when we were a part of the Plaintree affiliation. And this um, team is designed to um, help us round with a purpose the population is made up of um, adults, retired adults, many of them who are retired clinicians. Uh, they're pre-med students from the College of William & Mary. They're um, on track to be nurses at the community college. And these folks um, wear a uniform that's separate from all the other volunteer uniform. Theirs is a bright blue with the initials PAL, and it's um, the acronym is spelled out, Patient Assistant Li Liaison. Um, we have a great um, system where we have a train-the-trainer approach. We have a team lead of the PAL, and she will um, be the person who mentors the new PAL volunteer. She will round with them, and then when she has deemed them competent, um, and it's a, an agreement that both of them feel, then she cuts the cord and then the volunteer um, then becomes, um, you know, on their own doing the rounding. Um, we typically have a team of anywhere from 10 to 14 uh, PAL um, volunteers per semester. Um, the adults um, are part of that team and they are really our bread and butter. The college students, um, we all know, working with students that, um, you know, they have many demands academically on them, so, and they also have, um, you know, semester breaks. So we, we have to realize that they're, um, they're really here for a, a briefer time, but the adults are really, they're the real solid core of the PAL team. Um, most of them are non-clinical, um, and they round with a focus on patient safety, uh, especially falls. And then they help us to identify any service excellent, excellent champions um, that can be celebrated uh, by their manager and, and their, um, the team. And then um, when they round, um, they make sure that the, personal, the patient's personal preferences are met. So for instance, um, you know, if 
they want to have the chaplain visit them. Uh, they'll check that off, and after they leave the patient's room, they'll go down to the chaplain's office and let her know. Uh, they can also request a visit from one of the certified pet therapy dogs. Uh, we have a paid harpist on staff six hours um, a week, and they can request the harpist. If it's when the harpist isn't here, then we'll do all we can um, to, um, if she's not available, we have her CD and we'll bring the CD player in with her CD and play it for them. And then also, um, they've helped us to identify some unusual circumstances. So we recently had um, a Canadian couple who were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary and the PAL volunteer found out. And so she immediately let us know. We let um, dietary know, food services. Um, they brought in a special meal for them with, you know, candlelight meal. We had balloons there. Um, you know, it, the harpist came in and played for them. And it was just a, a great opportunity. And the patient's wife said, you know, we would never have told staff. We see how busy they are. But this volunteer just, you know, struck up a conversation with us. And we just shared that we, we had chosen to celebrate our 50th anniversary in Williamsburg. Little did we know that we'd be in room, you know, 313 for our anniversary. So at the end of the day, their experience was extraordinary and, and in huge credit um, to the PAL volunteer. Um, we've learned this phrase, nothing about me without me. Um, and we learned that, um, you know, through our several conferences that we've attended. And um, I, I honestly don't know who gets credited with saying that phrase, but we take that really seriously, that the patient wants to be involved. They want to make sure that we know what their preferences are. So our rounding um, really helps us get that valuable information. And again, it's readily communicated um, to the manager on that team. Uh, the PAL volunteer helps escalate any concerns immediately. You know, one, one of the PAL volunteers when they were rounding um, found out that, you know, a patient was really cold and hadn't voiced that. So she was able to get a wrapped in comfort um, blanket that we've got a team of 97 volunteers who've as of January, will have provided us with 4,000, um, th this team, 4,000 beautiful no-sew um, reversible fleece blankets. And the PAL volunteers know where they are, know where the storage room is, where they, they um, are available, and went down and got the blanket, brought it back up to the patient. And this saved, um, you know, the staff from having, the nurse from having to, you know, get a blanket that would eventually be taken away from the blank, the uh, PAL volunteer and go in the linen. This blanket that was delivered to her from Wrapped in Comfort is hers to keep. Uh, the Wrapped in Comfort team also provide the PAL volunteers with pillowcases, um, homemade pillowcases, and the the um, this patient is allowed to go home with that as well. Um, so the PAL volunteer can also escalate if the patient is on a walker. We have a team that make bed and caddy walkers. So the um, walker, um, beautiful caddy walker that, um, you know, keeps the patient's cell phone and their glasses safe and secure, uh, the bed caddies. Um, we discovered from a PAL volunteer who was rounding in the ICU unit that a patient's pair of glasses um, were broken by the, um, they got crunched between the, ar the arm of the um, bed and the mattress. And the PAL volunteer immediately told the manager, um, you know, we got the risk manager involved. She, you know, made sure that we purchased new glasses for the patient. But it was also um, because of that experience that um, we were able to identify that we needed to have another craft team help us to make these really nice bed caddies. So the bed caddy fits on the arm of the bed and it again holds the glasses, holds their cell phone, a little pad of paper, a pen, um, and the, the PAL team, when they're rounding, if they see that the patient can use that, then they readily give that to the patient as well. Um, some other examples of non-clinical services that our PAL volunteers can help, um, they can help orient the patient to the room, to the patient and family guide. They can, um, you know, assist with noting any special requests on the whiteboard. 
And they're also whiteboard, <laughs> the whiteboard Nazis for us because if they go in and the whiteboard hasn't been filled, there's an area missing, um, they immediately um, make the manager aware of that or the nurse who's involved in that patient's care aware of that. Um, they assist with any meal ordering. If the patient has any special dietary requests and they forgot to mention it, um, the PAL volunteer can help them with that. Um, if there's a, a you know an athlete that we have, you know maybe a William and Mary um, gymnast um, who you know got hurt on the vault last weekend at their meet, um, the PAL volunteer will make us aware of that. They'll call down to the gift shop. We'll send up some special balloons to the athlete. Um, you know, we even have some college logo fleece blankets. And if we're fortunate to have one of the William & Mary blankets left, we'll run that up to the patient or the PAL volunteer will. Um, they help with the setting up trays, um, opening packages. Sometimes the patients, you know, um, whether it's their eyesight or just the, um, they're very frail, maybe they're, they're very arthritic hands. Um, the patient um, assistant liaison will help with that. Um, they just, you know, are another pair of eyes and ears to make sure that the patient's comfortable. They'll fluff their pillows. Um, they'll fix the blanket for them. Um, they'll make sure everything in the room is working well, that definitely they know where their call bell is. They know how to access the Tiger Education channel um, on the television. Uh, they know how to, you know, navigate the TV. Um, and then if they're, um, if they're interested in having a newspaper or any um, magazines, they'll get that for them from the concierge. Uh, they'll call down to the concierge. Concierge will have the transport volunteer bring it up to the PAL volunteer, and then they'll give it to the patient. And then they also can help escort them if they're able to, um, to go out um, down to the chapel, to the gift shop, uh, to um, the, the lobby, we have several um, performances going on this week and next week. We've got one of our local churches um, is performing tonight for a couple of hours, their choir, and um, the PAL volunteer can wheel the patient out to enjoy that as well. And then um, partnering with hospital personnel is crucial. Um, you know, it's important that we educate the managers, especially new managers in the hospital. So during orientation, hospital orientation, we talk about the PAL program, the value of the PAL uh, program, because we want to make sure that the staff is also invested in this amazing group of volunteers. Um, <clears throat> we provide the PAL with hospital training. We provide them <clears throat> with unit-specific training. And we provide them with an experienced PAL mentor, which we talked about earlier. Um, we do a meet and greet with the key players on the unit. So we make sure the PAL volunteer meets and greets not just the nurses, but also the aides that are on the unit. Um, we have uh, pictures of the PAL available for staff, photos, so they'll know who they are. And all of this results in positive, positive staff um, buy-in. And then just one really quick case study um, to give you an example of how um, this really helped us um, with our issue around falls. So we have an amazing um, PAL volunteer, Dr. Bender, who has his PhD in organizational development. And we did um, a focus group, uh, four focus groups, um, with the frontline staff, with Dr. Bender, the head of the PAL team and um, asked the staff if they felt all precautions were implemented to keep the patient safe and prevent falls while they were in the hospital. Um, and 48 issues were identified by frontline staff. We narrowed them down to the top five issues, which were huddles, balance, modesty, blood count, and contrast. Um, and with um, the results of that, this information was then passed on to the PAL team, and the PAL was able to tell the, the patients, um, we're really working um, to keep you safe, and we have a number of things in place to keep you safe. So are you feeling that we have um, provided all precautions to keep you safe? And if the patient says anything but yes, then we um, ask what else they think that we could do to keep them safe. So um, as we close, I just want to tell you that, um, you know, part of the rounding 
um, tool really focuses on, on, you know, the noise level. We're focusing in on making sure that the patients have a restful night. So we'll ask them, are your nights restful as a result of minimal noise, interruptions, and, and light? And then um, around the, the um, patient satisfaction question, we know we're not allowed to ask the numerical, so we ask them to describe in one word uh, their experience, this experience. And if the patient, uh, patient assistant liaison hears anything but, you know, excellent, fabulous, superb, then they'll do a deeper dive and say, what can we do? What can the volunteers or the staff do um, to make you um, make this experience the best possible for you? And, you know, we know that HCAPS um, has to be the one that does the first formal survey that the patient receives, but we are allowed to go and ask any and questions that um, about anything that might be impacting the patient's clinical care. So the volunteer, the PAL volunteers can ask, you know, how, you know, you were admitted, were you admitted through the emergency room or pre-admission? And can you describe that experience? Um, you know, are you satisfied with, um, you know, the way everybody's been responding to your needs? So, you know, basically it's to get a conversation going, get a dialogue going, and then they have um, a form where they're able to jot down the comments from the patient um, and get that right back. So in real time, we can really nip any problem in the bud. So at the end of the day, the formula for success with all of our volunteers, whether it's PAL or patient and family advisory or the other volunteers that serve in a variety of areas throughout the campus, you want to match that volunteer's ta talent and their passion with the needs of the hospital. They might have the talent, they might have the passion, but you might not have that need. So you have to tactfully explain, you know, I appreciate that you're really talented, you know, in, you know, whatever their area of expertise is. But if you don't have that need, just say, you know, I'll keep that, you know, in mind. We'll keep it on our active file. And if any need like that comes up, we'll be certain to call you. But if their talent and their passion matches the need that you have at your hospital, you know, bring them on, train them, make them feel valued, and reward and recognize them. So the, the, that's the magic formula. Match them with, you know, what they are talented in, what they're passionate about, and then make sure that you, you pause and continually um, thank them when they come in, when they leave, and also um, reward and recognize them at key areas around, around the year. And that's it. Any questions? All right. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie and Margaret, for that excellent content. Um, I'm going to open this up for, for questions like Margaret just indicated. So please go ahead. If you, if you have a question here in the final minutes, uh, you can type it into the questions pane. I will relay that to uh, Margaret or Carrie. All right. Uh, okay, here we go. What do you put in the comfort carts? So I'm not sure if that was uh, for Margaret or for, for Carrie, but. So I can talk about the comfort carts. So, um, you know, again, it's your, the population that you have. Um, if it's a child that you're bringing things to, then obviously um, it's going to be geared to the child. So we have pediatric gift bags that include, uh, you know, a little book, um, some crayons. We have hospital um, coloring books. There's a great website where you can get a free hospital um, coloring book, and we can customize it to Centera Williamsburg. And then um, we have... Um, you know, stuffed animals that have, you know, brand new, clean, um, that we can allow um, for them. Um, if it's an adult, we'll put on um, reading material, obviously, um, you know, some spiritual information. We'll put um, blankets in there. Um, there's a little comfort kit that would include um, an eye mask, earplugs, earbuds, toothbrush, um, toothpaste, um, Sometimes there might be a little bit of hand cream that, that's put in there as well. 
And I think that's about it. Perfect. Thank you, Margaret. Uh huh. Okay, so I see one minute left. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone this year was awesome. Um, this is our last programming for the year, so I'll post this webinar to the website um, so you guys can review. And I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Thank you again to Margaret and Carrie. That was awesome. And I hope you all enjoy the new Star Wars movie that comes out tomorrow. And let's Mike, just pray it is nothing like episode one, two, or three. <laughs> Mike, thank you for all you've done this whole year to help all of us as, you know, we're challenged with, you know, making sure that we are improving not just the patient's experience, but anyone that comes with them, you know, their family member, their friends. So thank you for all you're doing at the state level to help us and for bringing Carrie on board as well. Well, and, and thank you, Mike and Margaret, and actually all of the Virginia hospitals, because I have to say that, it is a real pleasure to have the opportunity to work with Mike and Abraham and the team at VHHA, but also to work with all of you because you share so freely what you're doing and really have adopted this collaborative spirit that if you all work together, everyone will improve. Um, and that attitude and that approach is just fantastic. And it's to the benefit of everyone in Virginia and all of you, but it's really nice to see that um, alive and well in Virginia. So thank you everybody for collaborating and, and uh, working so hard on all of this. You're doing amazing work. And thank you, Margaret, for sharing today. My pleasure. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy your time with your family. Um, and we will be getting in touch early next year. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you both. Bye-bye.